My name is Joe Spadola. <clears throat> I'm an application engineer for uh, HBM Encode. And today's presentation is called Ensuring Aircraft Integrity Through Streamlined and Automated Data Processing. It's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, we'll address all of those, uh, those topics that I just talked about. So the, uh, the purpose of today's webinar, uh, as, you, as you might be able to guess from the title, is to see how ENCODE can help standardize and streamline your data processing and reporting needs. So a typical workflow um, for uh, you know, a, a company like yours might be you go out into the field, say you, you make airplanes or some sort of product that go on airplanes or something related to aerospace or anything for that matter. It could be ground vehicle, it could be uh, aerospace, it could be wind turbine. You're going to go out and uh, likely record some sort of data. So you'll have uh, strain gauges or accelerometers or force gauges or temperature sensors or, or whatever you want, anything you can connect up to a data acquisition device, you'll put it on your on your part or your product, um, put it out in its environment, or set it up in a test lab if you want to do some sort of uh, in-house testing, and, and you're going to record this data. After you record that data, um, I mean, you record that data for a reason, right? So you're going to want to process that in, in, in some way. Uh, in some cases, that might mean bringing it into MATLAB and, uh, you know, writing some code that calculates PSE or looks at RMS levels or just simply plots the data so that you can see what, it's, uh, what it looks like. Uh, for some people, that might mean bringing it into Excel and writing a bunch of VB macros that do some, uh, some data processing. Um, or you might use some other programs. There's a whole list of programs out there that, uh, that are available process measured test data. At the end of the day, though, um, that results, the information, whatever you um, derive from the recorded data is going to uh, need to be reported in some fashion. Um, ultimately, that's what uh, your manager is probably going to want to see. They're going to want to see the results of the, uh, of the analysis that you've done. So, you know, that might mean putting it in a, in a PowerPoint presentation, typing it up in a Word document with pictures. Um, or creating some sort of other report uh, that is handed to your manager or to your customer um, or uh, you know, whomever needs to, to see that data. Um, you're going to uh, put together a report that details what you've done. So as an engineer, we or you likely fit somewhere in this process, whether it's on the data acquisition side. If you're a test engineer, you might be in charge of putting on the strain gauges and reporting the data. If you're a data analysis, uh, or an analyst of some sort, you likely pick up where they left off, take their data, and then process it in some way. Uh, and then if you're a manager, you likely deal more with the reporting uh, and read you know, the reports and the uh, information that the engineers have, uh, have compiled for you. Um, what we're going to be talking about today, or what I'm going to focus on today, is how these two, um, uh, I guess, verticals here, the data analysis and data reporting, um, come together and how they can be uh, streamlined. Okay. Um, often spending a lot of time analyzing data, writing custom scripts on your, on your computer to reporting it, there can be a big um, time gap between those two, uh, just because it takes a lot of time to print pictures and copy them and generate the reports. So what we're going to talk about today, how we can Shorten the time it takes from getting the data off of your of your acquisition box to doing the analysis and reporting okay, to make to make these two boxes here that I highlighted in red. How do we make that happen? That's what we're going to be talking about. How we can do that with things. So this is what our agenda looks like. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background on ENCODE. Then I'm going to talk about two different. Um, Two different realms of, uh, of analysis here. We're going to look at test-based analysis, okay, where we're actually recording measured data from uh, from some sort of physical measurement, okay, strain gauges, accelerometers, force gauges, etc. Uh, I'm going to show a quick demonstration on, um, on how we build an analysis process within a piece of software that we have called Glyphworks. Then I'm going to show uh, the, the second realm of that, and uh, moving from moving away from the test-based side and looking at the finite element-based side. 
Uh, so what we're going to show is uh, a demonstration of the uh, capabilities that ENCODE has to process uh, virtual data, to process uh, results that come from solved FEA models. In the, uh, let's see how that is a minute. Then we're going to look at kind of tying all of that together uh, into what we call automated reporting. And I'll show you some examples of um, how we can automate these reports, automate the processing and the reports. Then we'll take it a step further and look at uh, what we call web-based data processing. And then at the end, we'll, uh, we'll finish up with a quick, quick uh, question and answer session if anybody has questions. OK, so uh, ENCODE as a, as a company has three different products. We've got Design Life, the LiftWorks, and Automation. I'm going to be talking about all three of them uh, here today in uh, various levels of detail. Uh, just to provide a quick introduction, Design Life is our CAE durability tool. Here we are looking at measuring uh, or taking solved FEA models and predicting fatigue from that. Uh, Glyphworks is the data processing, the, the measured test data processing uh, suite or system that we have. Uh, and then automation is the web-based uh, data processing system that we have. You can kind of think of it as a, a database, so like a, an Oracle or MySQL type database. Um, but these tools that I've just talked about, Glyphworks, uh, live underneath it. So we can actually process data automatically as it hits that, as it hits our automation server. So we'll see, uh, some more examples of that, or, or uh, uh, at least conceptually how that works uh, in a little bit. So to, to go into a little bit more detail, um, LiftWorks, as I mentioned, is uh, a test data processing system. Um, so we can not only process data, but we can uh, look at data in a number of different ways. Depending on what type of data you record, you might want to look at it in various ways. Uh, we've, we have the ability to uh, look at GPS data, uh, basic signal processing, so if you've got uh, filtering, math, basic editing, or stats that you want to look at, we can do that. We'll see some examples of that as well. Um, we can do fatigue analysis, so if you have measured strain gauge data and are looking to do uh, fatigue analysis, we can do stress life, stress, strain life, or crack growth analysis. Um, we can do it in the frequency domain as well, so if we wanted to um, create uh, accelerated vibration shaker table tests, that. I'll show uh, conceptually how that works later as well. Uh, and then we've got a collection of noise and vibe tools as well. Now, this is a, a, a small subset of everything that we do, but it kind of gives an overall, uh, hopefully at least an overall picture of the type of uh, types of analyses that we can do. And uh, I'll be highlighting several of these features later on. So we'll see, uh, we'll see more of that. Uh, Design Life is a tool that we have, uh, like I've mentioned already, that processes solved FEA files. So the idea here is that we uh, we take our FEA tool, whether that's uh, ANSYS or Abacus or NASTRAM, um, we apply loads, and then we bring those loads and the solved, well, we bring the solved stress models due to those loads into design life. And from there, we define how those loads change. Okay? Static load itself is never going to cause any fatigue issues. So if we bring those static loads into design life, they actually define how those loads change and then predict the based on that. So here we can do stress life uh, or strain life. And we can account for things such as uh, mean stresses and temperature uh, and, and plasticity and, uh, and a lot more. Um, we can also deal with more advanced um, analysis like uh, thermomechanical fatigue or composite fatigue. Uh, we can look at uh, weld fatigue as well or deal with multi-axial uh, stresses. Um, we support a wide range of, uh, of FEA tools, so you can do your analysis and answer that. We can analysis uh, all the major packages uh, we're able to, uh, to, uh, to accommodate. Uh, and again, we'll be looking at uh, a couple uh, particular features in this product in, uh, in a little bit. And then the third product we have is called Automation. And Automation, we call it the uh, web-based processing tool uh, for, uh, for processing engineering data. So again, the, the idea here is that we record a whole bunch of data out in the field. We put it up on our automation server. 
and then uh, it serves as a, as a database for all of that data. Uh, and once we have the database, we can do a number of different things with it. We can search through that uh, the content of that data. If we're looking for particular events that might happen in, in all of the data that we have, we can uh, run automatic or automatically run processes. We'll see uh, we'll see conceptually how that works later. And um, we can then also, once that data hits the server, we can not only run and automatically run processes, we can also automatically generate reports. Okay, so again, we'll see uh, more examples of that in just a bit. So let's first focus on test-based analysis case. So here again, we're talking about measured data. We go out into the, the fields, we put strain gauges or accelerometers all over our parts, products, and we put them through the, uh, through the test. Um, alternatively, if you have a test in your um, or a test lab in your facility in your in your company, um, you can measure data from there as well. If you've got a test stand and you're doing engine tests, you can uh, you know strain gauge your part or put whatever whatever sort of um, um, data acquisition sensors you want on your part and, and record that data there. So the point is we need to have some sort of measured test data. Um, before I go too much further, I want to Give a just a very brief uh, demonstration of what the uh, software actually looks like. Because what I'm going to be talking about uh, going forward is all of the capabilities that we have within the software to do various types of analysis. So uh, at the very beginning, what I want to show is how we would do a very simple analysis, and then throughout the rest of this presentation, talk about how what I just did or what I'm going to show you in a few seconds here can be extended to do uh, many other things. So I'm going to jump out of the presentation into the software real quick. So this is ENCODE. Uh, on the left here, you can see I've got three tools I just talked about. I have Glyphworks, Design Life, and Automation. I'm going to launch into Glyphworks right now by simply clicking on that icon. <coughs> Excuse me. And doing so will bring me into the uh, Glyphworks uh, workspace. Um, on the left here, you can see I have something called the available data window. This is a collection of files that I've pointed to. So before I before I launched Glyphworks, it asked me to point to a working directory. That working directory is the directory that contained all the information that I want to uh, that I want to, to do something with. Um, in this case, it happens to be a single test that has two channels in it. Okay, um, I could have pointed to a folder that has a thousand tests in it each with a 1,000 channels. Um, I could have pointed to something that had uh, Excel files or, uh, or histogram files or videos or uh, any, anything that you've recorded um, that Glyphworks recognizes, we can, uh, we can find it in this available data window. On the far right, we have something called the Glyph Palette. Uh, and this is a collection of all of our engineering functions, all of our tools. Um, it's organized by um, by these palettes, and each one of them is uh, is organized and they're titled to kind of indicate what the tools that you find in that particular palette might do. Um, I'm going to talk later about all the different, or at least a, a selection of what different tools we have available. Um, right now, I'm just going to show you a a simple example. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab um, some acceleration data that I have um, and bring it out and just drag and drop it onto my workspace. Okay, I can display it by clicking the display button and then I can maximize it if I wanted to look at uh, all of that data. <clears throat> um, I'm only looking at one particular channel right now. I could view multiple channels at the same time if I wanted to. Um, but for this example, I'm just looking at one. Um, from here, I can go in and I can interrogate data in any way that you might expect to when looking at measured test data. So I can zoom in, I can scroll around, I can rescale the axes. Um, if I had multiple channels here, I could overlay them on top of each other. Um, I can zoom out of the x-axis, out of the y-axis. Basically, any, any way you'd expect to be able to interact with this data, you can do so here. Um, I'm going to scroll back to uh, look at all the data there. Okay, so that's just viewing the data. Um, if I wanted to do some sort of analysis with this data, 
um, I can go grab any of the tools that I have available over in my engineering palette here and uh, do some sort of analysis. Um, just as a very simple example, I'm going to grab, uh, let's say, I've got this acceleration data, and I'm interested in what kind of frequency content is present in this data. I'm going to go grab what we call the frequency spectrum clip. Okay? And just like I got the data under the workspace, I can just drag and drop the glyphs onto the workspace. Okay, so from here, I can, um, so I've got my input data, I've got my engineering function, I want to view the results in some way, so I'm going to go to my display palette and just grab a display that I can look at. From here, I've got all of my data, I've got my engineering function, and I've got something that I can uh, view the results with. So in order to create this process or to bring this process together, I just have to tell Glyphworks where the data is going. So I've got my input data. I'm going to click on this output pad here and bring it onto the input pad of my engineering function. And then this is going to do some number crunching for me. The results are going to be put on this output pad here. So I'm going to take those results and send it to my display. Okay, so very simple. All I'm doing is calculating uh, the, uh, this is going to calculate a PSD for me. So I'm going to look at this data represented in the frequency domain to see what kind of frequency content I have present in this recorded time history. So to run the process, I simply click on this run button up here. And it happened very quickly, but you can see that the data was, it started here, it was sent through here, calculation was done, and the results were sent through here. Okay, so from here I can look at the results of, of that calculation. So I'm going to, yeah, let's look at the log axis. And now I can see here's my PSD. Okay? So that, uh, conceptually, is how um, Glyphworks functions. We've got input data, we have analysis tools, and we have output data. To just do a very quick example and, and, and build on to this, I'm going to um, do one more analysis just to, to show you how this isn't limited to just one single process. Okay, I can do multiple things at the same time. So this is acceleration data, and this happens to be acceleration data from a run-up. So I'm going to grab an RPM channel as well, okay, and this is the RPM trace as I ran up this engine. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly just do a waterfall analysis with this data. So I'm going to go to my frequency palette, I'm going to grab the waterfall analysis glyph, and just drag and drop it out here as well. So it's very modular. You can see how I'm building a completely separate process from the one that I've already created, adding on to it. So here I'm just going to send the input data to my waterfall analysis glyph, right? and then the results are going to be output on a uh, on the right side, I'm going to grab a particular display that will allow me to look at that. I'm going to grab a Campbell plot display. And from here, I can connect up. So now I've got two things going on at the same time. I've got the same input data. I've got a frequency spectrum calculation. So I'm looking at the PSD of that. And then I'm also looking at a waterfall analysis of that. Because I know the data is tied to this RPM trace, I'm using the waterfall. Analysis. So I can rerun the flow. Now I have not only results from my PSD calculation, but I also have results from my waterfall analysis. Okay, I can zoom in on this if I wanted to see it in more detail. <clears throat> and then, you know, there's uh, all of these glyphs have uh, properties. So I can go in and edit properties of these glyphs. So if I wanted to change the way in which this is displayed, I can simply click on properties and then say, um, you know, I want to see a legend and I want to use a color map. And then you can get a uh, um, more typical looking uh, camera plot. So the point is, everything comes together in this workspace here. All of our input data comes in. All of our engineering function, functions come in. And the data is then printed to the, uh, to the plot. Okay. Um, hopefully, hopefully that gives kind of an idea of what I'm going to, or at least a uh, kind of a, a foundational understanding of how this software works. So going forward, you can see how you can extend processes like this to do a lot of engineering processing within one workspace or a handful of workspaces. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the presentation now and talk a little bit more about um, what sort of analysis tools are available within there. You saw I had quite a collection 
of uh, of tools. Uh, so I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about some of the ones that might be of interest to you. Uh, the first thing that we have to ask, though, is you saw I had the available data over in the available data window that was on the left there. Well, where did that data come from? I, I said it came off a data acquisition box, um, but you know that could come from a number of different places, and it could come from a number of different data acquisition boxes as well. Um, if it came from physical measurement, like my particular example did, um, I have a strain gauge that measured some uh, some reported strains. And, uh, and I brought them, uh, and, I, and I put them on my computer, and then I pointed Glyphworks to that particular folder. Okay. Glyphworks natively supports 40, over 40 different binary data acquisition formats. So that means if you have to do some sort of processing and you guys have a new, um, and you guys have a new uh, data acquisition box, you don't have to write a new reader for that, uh, for that data. Okay. We support 40 different kinds. If it comes from simulation, let's say you guys do uh, some sort of uh, multi-body dynamic simulation where you're seeing how loads cascade through complex geometry due to um, some sort of input, we support those result files as well. So if you use atoms or motion salt, we can uh, we can read those files. Or if it comes from some sort of other source, um, say the data is just handed to you um, from uh, from a supplier. Uh, and you know they've done some sort of analysis. Say here are your here are your results. You need to process this data, and it comes in a CSV file or an Excel file or some sort of MATLAB file. We can support those as well. So we can read Excel files. You can literally just drag and drop an Excel file onto your workspace. Um, you can process CSV files. Or if if worse comes to worse, and all you're given is is an ASCII file and a big long ASCII file, we can process that as well. Um, even furthermore, we can uh, create custom file readers, so you can use um, if you've got uh, some sort of proprietary data acquisition box that has a very specific format or uh, or something uh, you know that we don't support, um, which is which happens to be quite rare. But if it does happen, uh, you can create custom file readers as well. Okay, so <coughs> excuse me. I want to focus right now on some of the tools that we have available that might be of interest in the basic uh, DSP palette. So I saw, or you saw, I showed you over there when I was in the software a minute ago, some of the tools um, or some of the different palettes that we have available. So as I go forward here, I'm going to have a particular palette open on the right. Here you can see I have the basic DSP palette. Uh, and then I'm just going to highlight a few of the features that we have available. Um, we can do filtering. So this would be filtering in the time domain, filtering in the frequency domain. Um, obviously, if you have some noisy data, uh, you're likely going to want to filter that down. Or if there's a particular process that you uh, that you run that has to have some sort of pre-filtering, um, you can do that with a number of our filtering ones. You saw already that we have the, uh, the CSD calculation tool. Um, we also have uh, something called a condition-based data selection. And this tool is quite useful if you have a uh, a rather long time history, and you're interested in specific events that might happen in your file. Uh, let's say you only want to uh, know, you know, you only want to extract data when the maximum value of a particular channel occurred, and then you want 10 seconds on either side of that. Okay, you don't have to go look through that data and then select it manually. You can use this particular tool to automatically select that data, and then you can uh, either extract that data or remove that data and send that downstream for further processing or ignore it from uh, from further uh, downstream processing. So we, we call that the condition condition based uh, data selection. That same tool will also allow you to uh, generate derived um, channels as well. Okay. In the uh, signal palette, I didn't show anything from this particular uh, palette, but in here, we have the ability to look at level crossing so we can see how many times a particular um, value is exceeded. We can look at uh, joint distribution if you're curious how uh, various channels, uh, how, how they correlate, if they do or don't. Um, <clears throat> we also have a series of anomaly detection tools. So if we have a channel or a series of channels that have some, uh, some spikes in it or flat lines, or drift, 
we can use some of the tools in this palette, our signal palette, to help us uh, not only figure out where that occurs, uh, but it can also help us automatically remove that as well. Uh, so you can see this picture here with the uh, automated anomaly detection on the, on the bottom. I automatically selected the uh, the spikes that have occurred in my data. Okay, and there are a number of different ways to configure that, just like you saw how I uh, access the properties of a glyph and change them. You can access all of the properties of these glyphs and change the way that they work. In the frequency palette, we have uh, a series of tools that allow you to view things uh, in the frequency domain, <clears throat> as well as some other uh, things in the time domain. Like we can look at, uh, we can do auto cross correlation or convolution, or here we have other various filtering tools, um, uh, frequency response analysis as well. <clears throat> this one I'm highlighting here in particular is uh, the joint time frequency analysis. So this is going to show us. Um, how our frequency content varies with time. So if we have, um, uh, you know, a particular channel, say, and uh, a, a standard uh, PSD is not going to not going to cut it for us because we know that we have some sort of transient content in our signal, and we need to actually see how that changes over time. We can use this joint time frequency analysis tool uh, to allow us to do that. Uh, and then interrogation on the uh, on the output plot, this color plot that I see here, this waterfall plot, it'll show me um, where various things happen, um, <clears throat> whereas the standard uh, PSD would not indicate where certain frequencies are present in time. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we also have the waterfall analysis tool um, in this uh, particular palette. Uh, this is the one that I showed you just a moment ago. So if we have RPM data as well uh, tied to our so if we have run-up data and RPM trace uh, with our vibration data or, or strain gauge or whatever it is, we can process that. So can I show you an example? Um, sorry, I forgot to, I guess I missed the button there. So this is the waterfall analysis. So here I've got my RPM and my acceleration, um, and I'm looking at a waterfall plot on the bottom there. So I showed you this particular data on a, uh, on a Campbell plot. You can also look at that on a waterfall plot as well. Uh, this is an example of that. And again, here we're looking at how the frequency content of our channel, um, of our signal channel, changes with respect to uh, speed as opposed to time. Okay, so here we're more interested in looking at uh, vibration or uh, various measures that happen per revolution instead of per second. Uh, and in this case, we are uh, at the bottom. We can actually look and, and see those lines that are flaring out like that are called orders. And what those are indicating to us is that a certain um, vibration is happening uh, with respect to a certain number of revolutions. So how many times is uh, is or how many times per revolution is something interesting? Now? Okay, so that's a wonderful plot. We also have, like I showed you, the ability to to look at Campbell plots. Uh, and on the Campbell plot, I just showed you a very basic example, but you can go in and throw down um, order lines. You can see the black lines cutting across uh, the center here. These are our order lines, um, so first, second, third orders in this particular case. You can look at mode lines as well, and these don't have to be uh, linear. These can uh, be nonlinear mode lines if, say, you see uh, as you run up some sort of stiffening or, or weakening um, or softening in the parts. Uh, you can also input um, say RPM lines as well to indicate critical speeds. So cruise or takeoff might be uh, might be an example of that. We also have the ability to do order filtering. Um, if I have my RPM and acceleration data, uh, like I showed you a moment ago, sometimes uh, people are interested in the um, the time series data of a particular order. So we can actually take our acceleration data okay, from the run-up, extract, say, just the first order or second order content, and, uh, and plot that. I know that there are a lot of companies that are interested in looking at particular orders um, on the waterfall plot as well as in, uh, in time. And here you can kind of overlay them. And I've cut off the legend here, but the legend would show you, uh, you know, the greens from the 
uh, from the second order, the red is from the first order, and the blue is from the third order, or etc. Uh, you can you can see how uh, how you can use that tool. Um, <clears throat> on the on the flip side of that, rather than extracting orders, you can simply suppress orders as well. So if there was something uh, uh, some sort of excitement along a particular order that you don't want to include in your in your time series data or in your waterfall plot, you can simply use this tool to suppress those orders uh, as well. It might be something like a, a first order wobble in a in a shaft or, or something like that. If you didn't want to include that vibration data, you can simply suppress that first order. Okay. Uh, we also have the ability uh, to create what we are what we call accelerated shaker table profiles. So if you have an electrodynamic shaker table and you run tests uh, on the shaker table in the lab, um, you're usually given some sort of PSD and you say, all right, here's my PSD. I need to run it for uh, X amount of time. <clears throat> um, what what we have the ability to to do with an encode is to take uh, measured data. So say we've got uh, some sort of duty cycle or information from, from the field. Uh, say that's 40, 60, 80 hours worth of, worth of measured data. So what we're coming up with is a duty cycle, basically, um, that represents the usage of this part um, through, uh, through time, right? If it, can, if it could survive this duty cycle, then it's, uh, then it's acceptable and it passes our test and we can uh, we can put it. Uh, um, we can warrant here or, or release it or whatever. It passes our test. <clears throat> um, what we can do is take that same duty cycle and create a shaker profile for it that takes a much shorter period of time. And we're not going to want to go replay 80, 90, 100 hours or thousands of hours worth of vibration data on this. Uh, on this table, that would cost a lot of money. It would take a lot of time, and it would be no different than actually just redoing the actual test. So the point is, we want to be able to create an accelerated version of that test that matches the customer usage data, but in a much shorter period of time, so we can still validate that part while uh, having a, a similar failure, failure mechanism and uh, um, accruing the same amount of damage. And what this, this tool will allow you to do is, uh, is exactly that. Uh, we also have the ability to do fatigue life calculations. So if I have measured strain gauge data, I can simply um, send that data to a strain life calculation glyph and uh, perform strain life calculations. And I can do uh, back calculations as well if I want to, rather than input uh, strain gauge data and see how long it will last. I can input strain gauge data and tell, and then say how long it should last, and then come up with a scale factor to see what I need to scale the loads by. Um, we also have the ability to do damage editing, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying accelerated testing in the time domain. <clears throat> uh, we also have crack growth and stress life analysis uh, that we can do here as well. Um, we also have a series of tools that, that we call uh, glyph builder. And a glyph builder is really just a scripting, um, uh, the ability to, to input scripting into a workflow. Um, so, you know, chances are if you work for a large company that has been doing some sort of analysis for quite a while, um, there's probably a process that goes something like this. I've got input data. I need to do a particular calculation. Um, there's one guy who sits out in the annex who's been doing this calculation for 40 years. He's been here so long, he has uh, more vacation time than, uh, than actual work time. And we give it to him, he does the analysis, and he comes back and says, here's your answer. Um, it's kind of this black box calculation because he's in charge of the code that, it, that does the calculation. He's in charge of, uh, of maintaining that and everything. The problem is what happens, what happens when he leaves or if he's not in and, and the rest of us don't know how to do that calculation. Uh, this would be an example of using Python or MATLAB to uh, not only unwrap those black box calculations to kind of expose the, the inside of that to uh, the people who actually run the process, but you can also incorporate custom or proprietary calculations. Say you've got a, uh, a very unique way of calculating uh, a PSD, for instance, and uh, you don't like the way that it's done in the software. Well, you can actually code up your own 
calculation and then use it in uh, in the actual flow. So you can keep uh, Glyphworks as a front end, but use your calculation uh, behind the scenes. Right? <clears throat> you can also use it um, use these tools to, uh, to import any sort of uh, analysis that you already have existing. So you've got a bunch of MATLAB scripts and you just want to keep doing the same thing but use a neater front end and not have to deal with the data translation and the hand holding uh, that involves um, uh, using MATLAB or Excel. So you can incorporate those right into the to our process. Uh, okay, so those there are just a few highlights of the test based world. Uh, I'm going to spend a second <coughs> excuse me, and look at um, what capabilities we have in the FEA world. Okay, so again, we can ask the same question, where does your data come from? Okay, if it comes from physical measurement, we can support um, that in the same way that uh, um, we supported it in, uh, in, in Glyphworks. We can also support that in Design Life. Um, chances are, if you're using Design Life, your data probably comes from simulation, uh, meaning some sort of FEA package. Uh, whether that's Ansys Abacus, Nastran, LSINA, uh, Mechanica, or OptiStruct, um, we can read uh, the results files from there. And again, if you have data from other sources, we can bring those in as well. So for the FEA world, we have the ability to uh, do virtual fatigue calculations. Um, so the idea behind this is that we use FEA to predict our stress and strain. We would bring that solved stress plot, uh, like you see right here. So this is from uh, ANSYS or Abacus or your FDA tool. We solve those stresses in, in our FDA tool. And we bring that RST file or the OP2 file uh, into Design Life. And then Design Life will determine, or you determine, what the virtual cycles will be. Okay? And then what we end up with is a, uh, a contour plot of life or damage. So we're basically turning stress plots into life plots. Okay, so, and uh, in FE, you can have multi-axial loads. You can have a load coming in on uh, this particular hole here, a side load coming in here, a torque over here. All those loads are going to be acting together in some way. Um, so we can determine in design life how those loads are changing. And then the, uh, the corresponding fatigue life or the damage occurred due to all of those changing loads will be output in the form of a life plot. Okay? So we have the ability uh, to do stress life calculations, strain life calculations. Again, we can look at mean stresses, temperatures, plasticity, stress gradients. Uh, we can also do weld fatigue and look at steam weld or spot weld. Uh, we have some, uh, some advanced analysis in there as well, like looking at thermomechanical fatigue or, or composite fatigue. Um, so positive fatigue is a very active area of research right now. Uh, the entire field in general, or the whole um, field of positive fatigue as a whole, is uh, is, is very new, and and uh, we're certainly doing a lot of research in this field, pushing the uh, um, pushing that forward. <clears throat> so over the next uh, several years, we will we will have um, more and more capabilities in terms of positive fatigue. I know a lot of a lot of companies are moving that way, and we're, uh, we're helping push the, uh, the research in that, uh, in that area. <clears throat> um, in the time domain, we I, I mentioned that what we have to do is we bring the stresses, and then we define how those loads change. We have a number of different ways that you can define how those loads change. Um, constant amplitude would be the very simple uh, use case. This would just be basically turning on the load or turning off the load. Um, so you apply a static load, say, and you bring it into design life and say, cycle that load on and off. Let's see how long it will last. That's the idea behind constant amplitude. Time series, rather than cycling that load on and off, what I'm doing is I'm defining or recording, actually, from the field, a history that represents the changing of that load. So I went in and I recorded with a, say, a, a, a force gauge or a load cell at the exact area of interest how those loads change. Okay. I then apply a static load in FE, bring that in, and then actually scale by this time history. So I'm replicating um, that time history in FE. Okay. So then the result would be not how many times I can do one particular cycle, but how many times I can repeat this history of whatever this represents. Okay. If I, uh, I also have the ability to look at transient events. So 
In this case, I would take in fully, completely solved stress states into FE to bring those in directly. Um, we also have the ability to uh, to do arrow spectrum loading. And, and arrow spectrum loading is just a file that describes a number of uh, combinations and sequences of various FE load cases that build up uh, what's called a load spectrum. Uh, so, you know, say you have, say you're looking at landing gear and you have um, a series of events that describe a series of events and locations that describe uh, how uh, basically a, a right turn when taxiing or a left turn when taxiing or a full stop or uh, or a takeoff or a landing. Okay. An aero spectrum load will allow you to build up that entire duty cycle and then analyze, uh, analyze that. <clears throat> we also have the ability to do um, uh, fatigue in the in the virtual, uh, or sorry, in the frequency domain. So our, what we call that is vibration fatigue. Uh, and in this case, what we're doing essentially is simulating shaker table tests. Okay, so <clears throat> in FE, what we would do is we would go solve a harmonic analysis or a solution 111, I think it's called in master, or a, a steady state dynamics and abacus. <clears throat> what we need is a representation of the stress states due to some sort of unit-based excitation. And then just like you would in uh, in your test lab on your electrodynamic shaker table, you would supply a PSD. In this case, your loading would be a PSD uh, as well. Okay. Um, now, there are a couple of different ways. I, I said the loading is a PSD. That's probably most typical or, uh, or most common. Uh, and we have the ability to either do sequential um, vibration, so if you've got uh, you know, multi-axis vibration, if, and, but you only have a single axis shaker table, what people will usually do is mount it in one direction, shake it a prescribed uh, time with a prescribed PSD, rotate it 90 degrees or into the, you know, a different direction, rotate it again, and then shake it and see if it passes the test. Uh, so within Design Life, we have the ability to do that. That would be the sequential or new in the latest version that we have is uh, version 11, uh, we can actually do simultaneous um, uh, or multi-axial vibration. So we're looking at all three axes occurring at the same time. Uh, we can also apply a uh, swept sign, uh, sign dwell, or a sign on random. <coughs> or if you have, um, again, custom or proprietary fatigue damage calculations, you can use Python uh, to incorporate those into your calculations. Well, here we can take into account um, the temperatures of your model um, or uh, you know, stresses and then, and then determine how the damage is, is calculated based on all of that information. Okay, so automated reporting. We, we do all of this analysis. We bring all this data in. We need to uh, create these reports. <clears throat> so what, what, we're, what we have the ability to do within GlyphWorks uh, you saw earlier how I had input data, I had some analysis, and then I had a series of displays that I kind of had in disparate locations on the workspace. Well, we have something called a studio display, and a studio display is a way that we bring all of that information together into one simple report. Okay? So you saw uh, earlier in the example I had uh, a Campbell plot display, and then I also had a PSD display. Well, this here allows me to put all this into a single page and then run that process and have this page output for me every single time I run it. So I could go in and record, you know, 30 different events or 40 different tests and drop all of those tests in here at one time, run this, and it will spit out 40 reports for me uh, just in the way um, that I that I dictate here, and obviously this will be updated through uh, every time this is run, it will have the information for that particular channel or test or however you set this up. Okay, so again, we build these on, on a virtual piece of paper, essentially, in our, in our process. Um, we can put any display objects we want on it. We can have logos. We can have uh, text information. Um, you can make them any size. This is completely customizable. Okay, and then you can output that for each run into a PDF format or a Word document or PowerPoint or HTML or even just a simple image, and that occurs at runtime. Okay, so you drop in all your tests, your 
process um, uh, or your, your, your process runs, does your analysis, it populates your reports, and your reports are generated automatically. <coughs> okay, so how does this kind of all come together then? We've seen how I can drop in a whole bunch of data into an input blip on a process and automatically create a report. But let's take that uh, one step further and look at web-based data process. The idea here is that we go out into the field or we're in our test lab, we record a whole bunch of data. Okay, so there's my, there's my vehicle. I'm recording a bunch of data. I load that data up onto our automation server. I, I talked about automation briefly. Um, we put that data onto the automation server. <coughs> Depending on what kind of data that is, I can have all of those pre-built processes living on that automation server. So say you have um, runoff data and you want to calculate uh, waterfall plots and Campbell plots and create reports based on that. You can automatically have this happen. All you have to do is take the data off your data acquisition box, put it on the server, and then let uh, automation do the rest. And then the last step would be after it's automatically processed and the reports are generated, you simply grab that report or grab the data, look at the information, and uh, <coughs> You know, you can then uh, go grab the, the result data if you need to look at the actual data. If there's something weird with the report, you notice something strange going on, uh, you can then go in and, um, and view those results or interrogate those results further. Um, you can also, depending on uh, what's happening, or what kind of flags you set up, if, you know, you want to be alerted by email, uh, if a certain event or something happens during um, – uh, during an analysis process, you can automatically receive emails from automation that says, hey, um, you know, a flag that you set up has been thrown. Uh, perhaps you should go look at this particular test. Uh, something might be wrong. Okay, so that's a way in which this whole thing would kind of come together. <clears throat> and again, you can upload data onto your automation server. You can search through that data. So it's not just a, a data store. It's actually an intelligent data store. We can uh, search through that information and look for particular things in keywords. Um, the key kind of here is that we can then analyze that data automatically. So as it hits the server, it's automatically analyzed. That automatically analyzed data can calculate new data, can create reports, it can email you, can do all sorts of things um, <clears throat> automatically. So you're literally just uploading your data. Um, so some use cases would be, uh, you know, using it to, to look at predictive maintenance or asset management. We've got a fleet of vehicles out in the out in the field, and you need to uh, monitor the usage of those. Um, the data can automatically be uploaded through some sort of mobile communication uh, device that's actually on the vehicle that's out in the field. The automation server can then grab that data and process it. Um, test tracks and flight testing or test rigs and test cells, um, any sort of information or data that you're gathering, uh, quite a bit of information on that you want to uh, process automatically, um, you, can, uh, you can use automation for it uh, as well. Uh, condition monitoring as well. So if you've got, um, in this case, we're looking at a, um, a bridge and you want to see um, you know, how various things are, are changing through time, <clears throat> you can look at the condition of that at any particular time if that data is being sent to, uh, to an automation server. Okay, so hopefully that kind of explains how, uh, how everything comes together. Uh, again, we're looking at reporting data, processing that data, and then reporting that data. And what I hoped to show you today was that ENCODE is a very efficient way to grab the data that you've already already recorded, process it in a number of different ways, and then analyze that and create automatic reports based on that. Um, it really streamlines the process. It's, it's you know, it's a one-click procedure, basically, after you, uh, after you record the information. You just drag in your, your files, your information, and, uh, and a report comes out the backside. And then, of course, after that's done, if you do see something um, some sort of anomaly in your report, you can then go interrogate that data further and use some of the other built-in tools that we have or custom tools if you want to create custom tools to, uh, to um, 
you know, dig deeper uh, into, uh, into your data. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to Amanda, and uh, she can uh, 